All right, so today we're going to do a video on the uh, ins and outs of the uh, Jeep WK. This one here is a diesel, but it mostly applies to all the vehicles, gas and diesel. I'm going to cover what I know about all of them. So uh, one of the good things about these vehicles is that you can pile lots of junk in them. I have done lots of moving of equipment and whatever. So today we're going to the dump. So we got a uh, shovel the tarp full of garbage in here, plus I put a bunch of trees on top. So we are going to go to the dump. All right, so while we're heading to the dump, we'll take a look at my old truck. It's this white Dodge here. Somebody just uh, about a block and a half away from me uh, bought this off of me. I was always quite happy with uh, this truck. It's actually pretty good for its age. It doesn't have uh, too much rust on the wheel wells. Just on the back a little bit. Pretty happy with the way this truck turned out. I didn't want to sell a guy a piece of junk. So I did a bunch of work on it. So after that, I got a three-quarter ton 91 Dodge van, and then uh, I got the Jeep. And then after that, now I got a 2004 uh, 3500 Chevy Express. So uh, anyway, we'll head on to the dump now. All right, we're just coming up on the dump here. So it's a pretty good dump, actually. Most of the things you can get rid of for free, other than household waste, you got to pay the same rate you have to pay to take it away from your home. It used to be free for everything, but I don't know. Now they want the town to be messy, so they make people pay. So uh, I'll turn off the camera when we pull around the corner here while the, they check us in. Some of the people are uh, pretty tight at the dump and they make sure you don't take anything out. Some people are pretty cool about it and they'll let you take whatever you want. So uh, we'll pop in here and we'll do a little tour around the dump and unload the vehicle. Looks like there's some activity here. Alright, so just dumping out the oil. We've got a big concrete uh, oil tank here. So just pour my uh, reusable oil container into here. And uh, saw something I spotted I'm going to try to grab and then we'll go get rid of the bush. Alright, so that's the destination there where we dump off all the uh, brush and yard waste. Sea containers have got the uh, recycling in them. Camera doesn't want to play game here. Then we got like our mountain of uh, furniture in the back that's been chipped and uh, scrap metal and whatnot. I got a, a good score here. I got a few hundred dollars worth of stuff. Oxy and acetylene tanks. So I'm pretty happy with that. I've gotten half a dozen tanks out of here over the last few years worth a couple thousand dollars. So uh, people are very nice to me. They drop them off and I can pick them up and uh, make use of them. Here, let's see if we can get this stuff out of here. Alright, so we just spend a minute cleaning that up, but that's uh, how you go to the dump with your Jeep. You're able to pull everything out there, uh, no problem. Alright, another good thing about the Jeep is if you see a bush road, you can just go ahead and take it. You don't need to go home and get your other vehicle. I find the paint has been pretty uh, solid on this vehicle. It doesn't scratch up too bad. My Honda Civic is horrible. If you touch it with anything, it strips the paint off of it. So you're doing the dirt roads. You gotta find uh, the right kind of speed where it's uh, not too slow that it's really hard and bouncy and not too fast that you bounce off the road. I guess I'll 
probably turn this off before it make you sick. But anyway, it's fun. You can be able to take whatever road you want. Clearance is usually pretty good. This vehicle's got a, a two inch lift, which isn't really uh, necessary for this. Now we're back from our excursion to the dump, so let's talk a bit more about the Jeep here. So one good thing I can see about this right away is that you can get wheels off of uh, various other Jeeps to put on these and you can get them very inexpensively because most people upgrade their wheels so you get your hand-me-downs from them to put on your uh, old WK. One issue with these vehicles is that they do rust on the uh, front fenders. This fills up with garbage from uh, up front. I haven't had it off this year to clean it out. In fact, I've only had it off once uh, to clean it when I bought the vehicle two years ago. And uh, about a year ago, in a year and a half now, I did a, a two inch lift on this vehicle. It was a very popular video actually. So I just wanted to show you the tires. So I had one wheel alignment done when I got it. And the, uh, even though my steering alignment's not perfect, the tires are wearing out quite nicely. These are actually pretty much done now. Didn't get any real cupping on the front here. I'm happy with that. You can't see it in this video, but uh, this back tire is cupping a little bit, but it wore down nice and smooth. And I only rotate them when they put them on in the beginning of the season. So I put my best two tires up front, then uh, obviously the worst two tires in the back. So uh, another thing with that video I was talking about that was quite successful is that. Uh, You'll have to replace the front suspension on this vehicle when you buy it. Pretty much everything from your inner tie rods out will need to be replaced. You'll need new struts, new control arms. Your wheel bearings at the front are probably going to be gone fairly soon, so you'll need to do that. So that's a, a couple thousand bucks by the time you do that and put the shocks on the front. I recommend you use good quality products. Not uh, A lot of cheap parts out there are only meant to, for reselling your vehicle. So I don't recommend you buy those because they're going to be pretty short-lived. This is a trail rated version which is like uh, pretty hard not to get trail rated. There's a couple ways you can do that though depending on the wheel combination and if it's uh, two-wheel drive because there's a few of those out there. What I was going to say is that the, the North Edition is like a Canadian edition which doesn't give you anything other than this I guess is kind of uh, an upgraded Laredo. It's not as good as a, a Limited or an Overland. It comes with, uh, on some of them, they've got like a bright trim kit on them. And then they've got this very fashionable uh, filler from uh, 2008. It was popular back then, very trendy. Not so much now. On the back, some of them, you'll see that they uh, have a rust spot up here somewhere. And that's because there's a seam in the uh, window seal that is like right here and the wiper fills up your uh, tailgate full of rusty garbage. This one is a 2008.5 so it's really a 2009 diesel rebadged as a 2008. It's got the uh, factory tow package which most of the diesels have. I'd recommend you get the factory tow package if you're going to get one. It's got good clearance you're not going to get stuffed into anything and uh, the vehicle also has uh, anti-sway for the trailer for the towing package as well and it had the full wiring out to the back I'll need to do a, a trailer brake uh, install at some point possibly but I've got a, a one-ton van I'm thinking is going to be my future tow vehicle I did tow a car with this once on a, like a, a tandem axle tow trailer, a car hauler from U-Haul, and it uh, worked out pretty good, other than the front end was jacked up a bit. So I've never changed the springs in this vehicle, and uh, if you do like the OME HD lift, Old Man Emu, you will get new uh, springs, but I just put spacers on top of the original coils, help get it up off the ground. When I got it, originally the shocks were completely worn out and every time you hit a bump, it would wiggle its rear, rear end because it would flatten all the way down. And the geometry of the suspensions on these with the links, that link bar that goes across makes your uh, axle go left and right as you're going up and down over the bumps. So your vehicle is kind of 
wiggling back and forth on top of that. So that's uh, not great. This was a city vehicle and uh, it's got some Bondo in this door. Surprisingly, it's not rusting. That's been exposed for the last two years that I've got it. I sprayed some oil on it last winter. I'll have to do that again. Roof racks are pretty good on this vehicle. I complain about that. This one does not have the upgraded mirrors. You can get them with uh, tilt mirrors when you hit reverse. They tilt down so you can see the back. That's my tilt mirror right there. I like to use that. These are aftermarket uh, mud flaps. I recommend them. I've got wheel spacers on it, but even before I bought it, when I was driving down the road, I could hear rocks bouncing off the side of the vehicle. So I put those on and uh, that sound has gone away happily. You can get a bright front grill for these vehicles. This is just a body painted grill. There's lots of damage to the uh, front bumper. There's some tabs in here, some ice from my excursion. You can twist these things around and take off this bottom fascia to get a bit more uh, front clearance. If you saw my Dodge there at the beginning of the video, I tore the front bumper off of it going through a ditch once. When I sold it, I put a new uh, bracket for license plate on it, and then I can see that he's ripped off the front bra or bracket off as well. So anyway, you need as much front, front clearance as you can to go through ditches and whatnot. The older models have the uh, fog lights up here. Well, I guess they're really driving lights, depending on what you do with them. And uh, this is like the, what do you call it? They upgrade the front of the vehicle, the facelift edition, right? So the original ones had like a flat line across them for the first uh, couple of years. And then these ones went round on the truck that you saw. They did the opposite. They had round from the early models and then they went flat across the bottom with the, the later models. I can't remember what year my truck is or was but uh, like I said it was opposite but they do a facelift on these things rather than completely changing them. So I've changed the front differential on this vehicle. It started to uh, have some problems. It was making a lot of noise. There's uh, three bushings that hold that differential in and you need to change those when you buy the vehicle because they're going to be in bad shape. So if you look up the front differential bushings or isolators, you'll see lots of videos about those. I didn't do a video on that because I saw there was a couple of good ones out there. I ended up using some Australian bushings for like the push-in ones. And then there's like a front bushing that goes in the front as part of a mount. And I got that one from uh, Egypt. So there's a few options there. We did a thread on the... Uh, Jeep forum. I can't remember the exact name of the forum, but it's out there. So you can look at that thread and you can see the different options for like the different poly options. I have spider tracks, inch and a half spacers in here. You don't need that necessarily. If you do put on the other Jeep wheels, I think you need to just so you can clear the calipers. But do your research. There's some good threads on uh, which wheels fit on these vehicles. So I said I changed the front differential. I also had a, uh, a bad shaft on the uh, this side of the vehicle on the front, so I had to change that because the CV was going. I really recommend you get a junkyard OEM shaft where you pay up the money and get a brand new OEM shaft because the reman shafts are just garbage. Even the ones from Mopar are not very good. They do not last very long. And this has been going on for decades in the aftermarket world. Because people are not prepared to pay what a good shaft is worth. So they go and buy these aftermarket ones and they end up having to change them every six months. So try not to fall into that trap. It's false economy. Your time is worth money even if you get a warranty on the thing. I had to change the uh, front drive propeller shaft. I don't know if we can see it here or not. But it's up there. So again, I bought a, a nearly new one that came off of a... A vehicle that somebody had given up on and was parted out. This motor on the transfer case is pretty famous for having problems. But before you replace it, you should check the connector and see if there's any corrosion in the uh, wiring. This vehicle is a diesel, it has a metal fuel tank. 
and it rusts out. I don't know if you can see it here or not. But like this right there. The garbage all piles up on top of the tank and rusts a hole in it. So you think I'd be smart enough to clean it off, but I just haven't gotten around to it. I'm not going to make an excuse. I just haven't done it. I know what I should. I'm going to pay for that eventually. You can put plastic tanks in them. you got to be very good at uh, flushing that tank out and getting it clean. Do your homework on that. Otherwise, you might end up with some uh, failed injectors on the diesels shortly after that. I don't know if they have varnish in them or what, but something happens when you put the diesel in it. The biodiesel is a bit of a, a solvent, and there's always a bit of biodiesel in diesel nowadays. So there's that. The front brake, or sorry, the rear parking brakes is like a, a disc with a drum inside of it. And that, uh, the drum portion is kind of flaky. Within a week of me buying this, my wife put the parking brake on and the indicator light wasn't working in the dash and I drove it for like 20 minutes with the parking brake on and I tore it up pretty good but the uh, rotors are stuck to the rear wheel bearings on here and they're actually like unit wheel bearings on the back so you can't take them off easily without ruining the bearings so eventually I'm going to get uh, new wheel bearings and at that point I'll check and repair the uh, parking brakes I'm just trying to think of what else we did. We can go look at my graveyard of parts later perhaps. I bought a divider. So when you're in the city you can cover your stuff. That's pretty handy. The height of the vehicle is good. You can go underground with it. No real issues there. I assume the back seats are comfortable. They seem like they're a good size but I would never know. There's a 120 volt power here you can control from the dash so you can uh, it's close enough you can reach it when you're driving you plug something in if you need to you're not supposed to put a curtain rod in these vehicles because there's uh, air curtains in here so uh, if you're gonna do it think about it carefully because uh, you might lose your air curtains depending on how it happens Pardon me, I think that there's still enough space to get in the curtain to plop down here, but I'm not going to say for sure. So that's your decision if you decide to do that. Oh, someone chewed a hole in my seat. Yeah, every one of the WKs is like that. So when you buy it, plan to replace uh, the seat or live with it. I got to do something with it before the chunks of foam start coming out. Speakers are good in it. I can't complain about that. I put a steel armadillo plate here, I'm happy with that, with a, a Blue C dual charger. I did mention this in another video, but they're at the top of the fuse panel. I can't see, but you can cut the spade and narrow it so you can fit it in there. Just add a fuse, an inline fuse, and you can get power for that. I have... Uh, a ram mount here mounts onto the uh, seat support. So I put my radios here. I use them when I'm driving. I just listen to what's going on in the world. I'm planning on doing a video about these eventually. Just haven't got around to it. I like the radio, other than it works with iPhones, and I wish it was a little bit different. If you could just put a USB stick in it, that would be cool. But that's uh, not an option. So it doesn't charge the iPhone 4S, which is like, could be one of the lower, later ones, iPhones that actually had high memory capacity and like the big, whatever wide connector is. So that's too bad. You're better off buying an iPod and verifying it charges with this thing. You just go to the pawn shop and pick up an iPod, bring it outside. And if it charges, keep it. If not, just bring it back into the pawn shop and uh, return it to get your money back clip my uh, phone on here when I'm driving. I got my cable. This goes over here. I'm trying to think. Of, oh, lots of annoying things with the interior of these vehicles. So the lights all burn out in this uh, enclosure. You can get new bulbs and solder them on. Or you could take uh, some LEDs and solder those on. I haven't seen a really a good video to do that with all the proper part numbers and like from beginning to end with everything working. 
but it's uh, something doable. And you got to be concerned about the uh, the light intensity of the bulbs, otherwise they could be a bit too bright. This has the uh, automatic mirror, so you don't have to flip it back and forth. I like that. That stupid Honda doesn't have it for some reason. It's a 2013 or 14. I brought it to Honda and they got mad at me because they didn't know what year it was. I told them it's just a Honda, who cares? The 2004 van has an automatic mirror. Like, come on. Honda, get with it piece of junk car so anyway the uh, blend doors in here to turn the, the defrost on and flip from like a defrost to floor or hot to cold there's motors that actuate those those are a problem they can go bad on you so you have to replace them from time to time and uh, what else is there in this case I don't have air conditioning most of the time sadly <laughs> So I drive with my windows down a bit, but uh, I might need to take the console out to fix that as a end result. And uh, Chrysler only supports vehicles for about 10 years after they cease manufacture of that model. So uh, they're going to start discontinuing a lot of parts for these vehicles. And uh, on the diesel, the wiring harness is not good. It can have problems. We'll pop the hood and take a look at that. Actually, I'm just going to stop the video. We're getting up to like 16 minutes. I'm going to clear the uh, lens. I thought I might have saw something on there and we'll get going again. Well, that was an ordeal. This camera is uh, suffering from the last video I did there with the fuel filter. It doesn't want to open or close anymore. So you can open the uh, hood there. It's got power seats on this side. I always wish that the slide was just by hand. Actually, honestly, I don't really like power seats because like, I like to sleep in the vehicle if I'm doing a long drive. And it's just so melodramatic, like trying to recline this stupid seat so you can take a nap and then like reviving yourself from the dead when it brings it back up. So I'm more of a, a manual seats kind of person. So it's pretty easy to open, you just push your thumb like that. It's got hydraulic uh, cylinders on the hood. So that's cool. There's my fuel filter. Leaking diesel. I didn't do a good job apparently. <laughs> so I have to figure that out. It's kind of smelly. So, uh, right, I forgot what we're doing. So these wires here, and here, there's computers and fuse panels. And right underneath of the battery is the main computer. And the original batteries on these vehicles had a problem where they would crack open and leak which is pretty horrible. So uh, they would get acid all over the battery, eat it open, and damage the connectors. And then uh, you can see that I put some rubber line on the battery tray. And there's some uh, like high pressure AC lines down there as well. You have to put rubber all over those lines and protect the electrical wiring so that they don't rub. That's important to do that. There's the uh, breather for uh, the transfer case or the transmission. I don't recall which one that is anymore. They don't come with a dipstick if you have the diesel, the uh, SRT8, the big Hemi, or the V6, because they all have like uh, a Mercedes Nag 1 type transmission. So I did a video on how you can check that. With the diesels, when you're filling it, you got to use a funnel, otherwise you'll pour oil on your alternator, which is down there somewhere and it'll burn out shortly after. In fact, you need to replace this uh, filler on these diesels, otherwise, or at least change the gasket on them, otherwise they'll leak. That's a common problem. A lot of people have had bad alternators as a result of that. This thing goes forever on an oil change. Like uh, I do 12 or 13,000 kilometers on them. No real problems. If you have the diesel, I'll talk about the gas engines after, so please hang in there. This is uh, an actuator for the variable vane uh, turbo. So it can close the inlet ports on the exhaust side. So it can just let the turbo free spool. And so you adjust the uh, pressure, your boost. So that actuator I think is made by Honeywell. They have some issues. You have to replace them eventually. Which almost says Hella on it. Maybe, I thought something I own had a Honeywell Turbo, but maybe not. 
so anyway there's that the uh, original diesels had uh, a bad fitting here it would leak oil on top of your engine cause problems and then this uh, fitting here this silicone thing that pushes in can be bad watch out for that I mentioned the uh, fuel filter video underneath it here there's a swirl motor and it's got like butterfly valves on the uh, intake manifolds and I don't know if it really does anything or not but it will fail so some people put a resistor in line so they can limp home that's a pretty common problem and there's an oil cooler in there as well at the bottom so if you're looking at a really high mile diesel that has got oil all over it like engine bay is full of oil I saw one had oil all up on the hood it just oil everywhere it's because of the oil cooler and then the uh, seals for the intake tube so watch out for that if you got a gas model the uh, earlier Hemi's had valve issues I don't know if they dropped valves or whatever it was but they're pretty catastrophic and they burned a lot of gas so I would kind of avoid them the newer Hemi's had the variable valve timing you could turn off the cylinders and all kinds of different things they're, they're pretty cool you could go with one of those but I find that the horsepower and the torque in the diesel is quite good the uh, truck that I showed you had a 4.7 liter it was an older generation than what was in these vehicles 4.7s are pretty good you can't complain really other than that one had antifreeze issues for whatever reason and uh, the radiator was plugged so you got to deal with things like that I think the uh, the diesels have a bit better uh, antifreeze in them I have not changed the antifreeze yet I put a, a belt and idlers on here I did a minus 27 Celsius start on this vehicle and the belts were just screaming when I started it so I was kind of concerned about that so I changed those I love that this thing has factory remote start you didn't have to hack into the wiring or anything I did a video on changing the uh, brake booster and the uh, master cylinder it's been relatively popular I'm pretty happy with that so there are some vehicles that have problems with that out there it's a little bit tricky to get it out of there this is the ABS pump here the Honda has the exact same ABS pump in it seems like it's a pretty popular part just needs to be programmed with uh, the right info for your vehicle I don't know if you could take one from a Honda and put it in a Jeep or not but from the outside uh, they're all the same some of these on the newer ones will have a uh, not a GPS but accelerometers in them to tell the braking computer what's going on with the vehicles rolling or what's taking place some of the vehicles have a hydraulic uh, fan on them I was trying to think if it's the, the diesels and the Hemi's maybe but uh, they tell you to use a special fluid do use the right fluid otherwise you're going to be in big trouble if you uh, empty the system you need to draw a vacuum on it you got to put a special fitting on top of here and draw a vacuum to get all the air out of it otherwise your new uh, parts could be short-lived this is the glow plug controller some people have trouble with these but it uh, I have so far but if you do need to replace it be warned that there's two different voltages of glow plugs in the world on these vehicles and you need the right glow plug controller for the right voltage for the uh, application you've got so spend your time read the forums and learn make sure you get the right one right and uh, the glow plugs I struggled to find them last time I did a video but they're right there under the the gray caps the one on the back can be a bit problematic to replace you need to use a torque wrench to take them out you'll find some vehicles that are for sale where they got glow plugs broken off on them so get something like the blue driver and read the codes I did a video on how to do that as well So never leave home without it and it's sad to say that there's really good electronics on these vehicles but they're unfortunately not as reliable as you kind of wish they would be so uh, definitely get the blue driver if you get the diesel or the NAG1 transmission which is in the gas model as well some people have trouble with the shifter I don't know if it gets dirty or what I haven't had a problem with it but sometimes 
that the shifter doesn't work. And there's actually an interlock. You've got to put your foot on the brake, and then it moves a paw inside of there before you can take it out of park. That's an issue. On the gas models, they tend to break exhaust studs for some reason on the exhaust manifolds. And on the gas models, they've got the uh, O2 sensors on them that seem to be problematic. I don't know much about O2 sensors other than you need to have a scanner. Take your time and read the codes and really understand what's happening before you replace any parts because it's probably one of the issues I've seen is that people just have broken studs and that's causing your O2 sensors to go out of range. So consider that. And then if you're down in the States, people end up putting like used motors in these vehicles or overhauled motors and it's pretty expensive. Like being in Canada, when the motor goes in this, the vehicle is going to be worn out anyway. So I don't have any experience in that. But I would suggest maybe if you overheat your vehicle and blow the gaskets on the heads or something, you probably just need another engine. Uh, an engine that's been torn down is never as good as a factory built engine in my opinion. So uh, keep that in mind. The transmission, the ones with the NAG1, which I'd mentioned earlier, the Mercedes transmission, they have a big circuit board in them. And that circuit board gets fouled by uh, metal contaminants. So you have to change the circuit board. If you're getting all kinds of weird speed sensor errors when you go in with blue driver, that's probably the reason why, is that that circuit board is junk. It's available from Dorman. There's two versions. There's like the uh, American version of transmission, which is on the gas models, and then the German version of the transmission, which is on the diesels, because they were shipped together. So you'll want to get the right product, you could do a bit of research and make sure you get the right one. I've posted on forums about that a little bit. I think, I, yeah, I, I'm not going to speak much more about that other than just to watch out for that. You use ATF plus four transmission fluid in these vehicles. You don't use Mercedes fluid or any of that stuff. Um, starting to run out of things to talk about. But anyway, if you're going to buy one of these things, I don't care how nice and new it is or whatever they say, plan on spending a few thousand dollars on it in the first year. There's one fellow there that did a video, I think he said he spent $7,000 on it in a short period of time. I can see that happening. So if you don't need a 4x4, don't buy one of these. You can get a two-wheel drive version. Like that's why my old truck is still on the road is because it's a two-wheel drive truck. I didn't need a 4x4 at the time when I bought it. It's a summer vehicle only and save you thousands of dollars on front-end problems by buying that. So I don't want to scare you, but I want to be honest about it. Like I replaced uh, a Pontiac Vibe with this. The Pontiac Vibe went forever and it never needed anything other than the power steering pumps a couple times. Never any issues with that vehicle. It started to have problems and I went and bought this, thinking, oh, I have a, a newer vehicle with less miles, but my God, the amount of problems that you can have in a vehicle is a, a surprise. So once I went through the front end on this and fixed the shafts and fixed the transmission, it's been good. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the vehicle. It was tough at the beginning, had a lot of issues. Oh, another thing is that because the electronics are kind of finicky, is that you need to keep a fresh battery in it. I think uh, the F7 is like the month and the year, so it's a 2017 battery, more than likely. It's only good for a couple of years in these vehicles and they kind of tear them up. It's not as bad as my Volkswagen diesels, like they used to eat batteries like mad and eat glow plugs and everything. But uh, it's uh, a better diesel. The smell of the diesel exhaust on this vehicle is kind of weird. Some people do various different emissions deletes on it. I haven't done any of that. I'm quite happy with it. You can get a, a green something kind of a program for green diesel program for your computer. People are very happy with that. You could consider doing that. But if you haven't changed uh, your front differential rubbers and everything, it's just going to tear your drive line to pieces. So make sure everything is in good order if you're going to hop up the vehicle. 
So anyway, thank you for watching. I think we're probably rolling up around a half an hour long video. Hopefully this one's more popular than my motorcycle videos. I put those up uh, yesterday and within 12 hours I already had three subscribers bail on me. Which is kind of a surprise. <laughs> but I like the videos so I'm going to leave them up there. Hopefully you, you keep an open mind. I'm going to have some different kind of videos coming up in the future. I'm not trying to get away from vehicles but I want to branch out a little bit. I'm trying to get up to 500 subscribers and uh, either I'm going to alienate everybody and they're all going to leave me or maybe I'll get a few more subscribers that uh, want to look at my different hobbies and the things that I'm into. So thank you for watching.